<coughs> Testing. Happy Sabbath. Oh, must be cold. Happy Sabbath. Nice to see you guys this morning, well, this afternoon. I'm not going to say this afternoon. Um, but thank you so much for the lovely sharing, for the wonderful testimonies that people and the, the children shared this morning. It's all about the mothers today, isn't it? Well, I should say ladies. It's all about the ladies today. My, I was up at the school a couple of days ago, and I had to help my son with the, the stall that they had at the school. And at the stall, you would go up, or the children would go up, and they would buy a present for their mums. And so I had to help out at the stall. Anyway, my son's class comes forward, and I see my son coming up, and I know exactly what my mum, well, what his mum needs. I look down at the stall, and there's some pretty good items on the table. And I was thinking in my head, why don't you go for the tea, the teacup? Go for the teacup. And he comes through, he has a look, and I said, son, the teacup. And he says, yeah, okay. And he goes through, he goes past the teacup, and he walks down to the, and there's a fluffy pen and a notebook. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe he's going to go for the notebook and the fluffy pen. No, he walks back up the aisle, has a look, you know, kind of has a look properly at the table. There's a lot of good items on the table. Mum, I love you, little trinket boxes and things like that. And he's looking, and I'm thinking, son, come on, you've got to pick that for mum. Mum loves that. Go for that. Anyway, he comes back and he chooses something, and I've never seen it on the table. Normally they have multiple things on the table. But he picks up this little thing, and he brings it, and he opens it up, and it's a tool kit. And it's got a screwdriver in it, and it's got attachments to it. And he says, this is what I'm going to get, Mum. And I'm thinking, no, son, you've got to go for the other one. That's what Mum likes. Anyway, so he goes, gets his money out, and he pays for it. And then I'm thinking, oh, man, I better buy something just in case Mum doesn't like it. And so anyway, I picked him up after school, and I said, son, what did you get, Mum? And he said, I got Mum a toolbox. And I said, why did you get that? Why did you get it for Mum? He said, because mum keeps asking you for your tools. So you know what? I'm going to get her own tools, okay? And I was thinking in my head, okay, good, good, son. That's okay. We'll get mum her tools and we'll start her tool collection from today. Anyway, it's a blessing to be here this morning or this afternoon to share with you guys. And it is lovely uh, just to be surrounded with so much love for the mothers and all women. They say that the uh, women have a, a higher pain tolerance. Is that, is that true? I don't know. The, the, the gents? Is that too controversial, maybe? I don't know. But we thank God for our mothers. I can't see my mum, but I know she's about three hours away by plane. And I thank God for our mothers. But anyway, if you have an opportunity to say I love you to your mum, please do. Please give her a hug from me as well. Let's start our uh, service this, this afternoon, and I just want to share something small. Uh, let's say a prayer as we begin. Lord, what a blessing it is to be here this morning or this afternoon, and Father, just to be in your presence. We thank you so much for the mothers, Lord, that have uh, been there for us, that have just loved upon us, and we pray a special blessing upon them, Lord. May you fill them with your love as well. May you keep giving them strength to endure. And please be with our service, Lord, and what I have to share. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I've entitled my sermon this morning or this afternoon. I keep saying this morning. They showed valor. They showed valor. What's the most iconic? Give me some names of some iconic places in Canberra that we go to. War Memorial. Good. You must have read my sermon. We go to the War Memorial, and if you go to the War Memorial, it's divided into sections. And if you go in, they've kind of, uh, you know, they're doing some renovation. But if you go to the War Memorial, they've got different sections. They've got World War I section. They've got World War II, the Pacific War. And if you like history, you need to go there. But if you go there, you would find a hall, and does anyone know what the hall is called? It's called the Hall of Valor. 
And if you go there, you would find this uh, award hanging up and you'd find writings about the people that got the award. And it's quite iconic, but the Australian War Memorial is lined up with this and they've got this section kind of tapered off called the Hall of Valor. What's interesting is the Hall of Valor or the the award is, does anyone know what this award is called? It's called the Victorious Cross. It was first instituted in 19 or 1856 by Queen Victoria and it's the highest award you can get for ba bravery. And you'd be pretty uh, good if you got this or pretty recognized if you got the, the award. There's another award for civilians. Does anyone know what that's called? So you can only get this award if you serve in the military or the armed forces. There's another award and it's called the Cross of Valor. Now this award is for you and I. It's more for civilians. By the way, the Victorious Cross, there's only one lady that managed to get the award. And, um, and she was called Elizabeth, I think. Harris, and she got an award for serving in India. And she was a nurse, but she managed to get the award. And, uh, but this other award here is for commoners or civilians like us. So I'm talking about awards. What's interesting is a comment that someone made. In fact, JFK made this, made this comment or this quote. He said, for without belittling the courage with which men have died, we should not forget those acts of courage with which men have lived. So I'm recognizing these awards, but I don't want to take anything from those who have served and died for freedom, amen? But we should try to remember those who have lived with acts of courage. What is he trying to say? He's trying to say that we shouldn't take away those courageous acts, those people that have served, that have gone maybe before us, that are serving today with acts of courage. I want to share a bit of some, uh, a few stories with you this, this afternoon about this woman here. Does anyone know who she is? Harriet Tubman. She grew up during the American Civil War and she was born a Marita Rose, but later changed her name to a mother's name, which is Harriet. She was born into slavery and when she was 12 years old, she was hit on the head by a weight by her master that she was serving. And she would go on later in life to hold that injury until she passed. But what's interesting is she finally escaped her mother's, uh, her, her masters and became a social activist who started rescuing others from captivity. In fact, she was such an inspiration and so successful in her attempts to free others, they named, nicknamed her Moses. Harriet made 19 trips over the course of a period of time into Maryland to try and rescue slaves. She would take people through the Underground Railway, uh, Railroad to a set of safe houses. Anyway, she was so successful that they offered a reward for her, $40,000. In today's money, it would be over a million dollars. And they offered that for a capture, but she was never caught in the end. What's interesting also is up to 700 slaves were freed because of her valor, her bravery, her courage. Harriet was an abolitionist, a key figure in the fight to end slavery. I just want to share the three characteristics of valor. Harriet overcame barriers to progress. 
She didn't let her circumstances, uh, circumstances dictate who she was or who she would become. She was a slave, but she didn't think like a slave. She saw beyond to her situation, to freedom. So the first point is that she had barriers, but she progressed over the barriers. The second point is this. She had an unflinching faith. She believed in God, and so Christianity was the source of her strength. She was encouraged by the Bible stories her mother used to read to her. Harriet placed all her fears in God. Because of her trust in God, she was not only able to attempt one rescue mission, but 19. She loved God. She remembered the stories that her mother told her. Notice what she says. She says, I pray to God to, get, to make me strong and able to fight. And that's what I've always prayed for ever since. Faith will give courage to endure. An unflinching faith. The third point is this. Selfless service. So we've got barriers to progress. We've got an unflinching faith. And then now we've got the third point, which is selfless service. Harriet did not think of herself only. She thought of others. I have heard their groans and sighs and seen their tears, and I would give every drop of blood in my veins to free them. Barriers to progress, an unflinching faith, selfless service. She was an example of all three. She showed valor. I want us to have a look quickly at some Bible characters. There are many examples in the Bible of courageous people, and we can name some today. And some served not necessarily on the battlefield, but served in the acts of their life. They were valiant in life. And when a crisis came, they demonstrated valor. Like Harriet, Queen Esther showed three characteristics of valor. She showed barriers to progress. Despite being an orphan and adopted, Esther adapted to change with a grateful heart and an open mind to a new country to new customs, and a new role in the royal palace. She overcame barriers to progress. She had an unflinching faith. Even though she started out in, in, in sorrow, she could have easily turned away from God. But no, with godly counsel, she continued to believe in the God of heaven. Now, as a Jew, she believed in God, and so she took those beliefs and those values to the place that she moved into. She moved into the royal palace. She not only demonstrated courage, but she demonstrated faith, a faith that was not wavering, a faith that was not dependent on her cousin. Remember, her cousin Mordecai had got her into the royal palace. But her faith wasn't dependent on him. By surrendering her fears to God, God placed her in the right place at the right time. If you have your Bibles with you, I want us to turn to Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. And these passages are familiar. We've heard them before. 
Esther chapter 4, and go to verse 14. What does the Bible say? For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Notice what he goes on to say. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for what? Such a time as this. God placed her in the place where she was meant to be at that particular time, at that particular moment, because that was to demonstrate a faith that she had. An unwavering faith. An unflinching faith. As God puts you somewhere today at such a time as this, and are you displaying that unwavering faith? Esther also had selfless service. Esther put her life in the line for the people. Her people were sentenced to death. And as a queen, she had access to the king. But remember, she knew who she was. She was an Israelite. And as her people were sentenced to death, she knew that it could come down to her to make a change. It could come down to who she was and where she was at that particular time. Go with me to Esther 4 and verse 16. What does Esther say? This is Esther's reply to the death sentence that was put out by the king. What does she say? Go, gather all the Jews who were present, who were present in Shushan, and fast for me, neither eat or drink for three days, nights or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I shall go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. She was willing to die for her people. Esther faced her time of crisis and she stood up to the true calling. Women have this sense of persistence, don't they? I know my wife does. With me, she keeps asking and she keeps going and sometimes I give up, but she'll keep going. It's a mother's instinct probably. They don't give up easily. And here we see Esther in this position of influence, in this royal palace, by herself. She was an orphan, remember. She had not grown up with her mother, yet she was there, and her cousin Mordecai was actually outside the palace. But she says, look, fast with me. Let us pray to our God. But notice her reply in the end. If I perish, I perish. An unflinching faith. Do we have that today? Mrs. White says that there's a time coming where we will face to face with death. And that is a time that our faith will be tested. We live in a free country at the moment, don't we? Don't we? It co it's comfortable. But how about when we're faced with death? What happens then? Is our faith unwavering? Selfless service. Esther put herself in the line of death. She wasn't moved. She wasn't phased. Barriers to progress. She overcame an unflinching faith in God. She had. 
and selfless service. She was willing to lay down her life for others. If you ever get a chance to read a book called Courage for Crisis by Arthur Maxwell, he writes this. Where does this amazing valor come from? Chiefly, it could be a combination from some loving purpose and some noble dedication. He goes on to say, however, people who go to pieces in a crisis are generally those who have lived a self-centered life, purposeless life, dedicated to nothing in particular but their own selfless interests. Whereas valor, valor is different. Valor that is intimately linked with faith Dedication enables a person to ensure all manners of hardships without flinching. It spurs him or her to incredible feats of daring and sends him through fire and water with a smile on his face and a song in his heart. That's what valor is. That's what courage is. Where does this amazing valor spring from in your heart? Where is it coming from? We know one of the greatest persons to ever walk this earth was Jesus. The noblest of all examples was Jesus Christ himself, wasn't it? And a prime example of Jesus was his ability to be able to withstand anything. Where did his power, his source of power come from? Jesus had barriers, remember? Jesus faced opposition as soon as he entered his ministry. The fact that he was a Nazarite, can anything good come out of Nazareth? The location itself brought prejudice against him. The fact that he was a carpenter's son, he wasn't a, a kingly kind of person. He didn't have status. Many believe that he was the deliverer for the Jews from the Romans, but yet alone, a prophesied Messiah. But was he the Messiah? Was he the king that everybody expected? Jesus had barriers to pro progress. Hebrews 2, verse 12, what does it say? Go with me there if you have your Bibles. Hebrews 2, Hebrews 12, chapter 2, sorry. Chapter 12, verse 2. What does it say? Looking unto who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For who? For the joy that was set before for him endured the cross, despising the, the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus had barriers he had to progress to. He had to progress over. But he faced his ministry despite the, the, the doubts Despite the accusations, he faced his ministry with faith in who? In his father. He had an unflinching faith. Jesus revealed faith in his father. Where he received his identity and his purpose, nothing was to deter his faith from the mission that he had to fulfill. Calvary required faith, not just sacrifice. Mark 14, 36, what does he say? He said, Abba, Father, all these things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. An unflinching faith. His faith was tried 
We're talking about the Son of God. Even he had to have his faith tried. And right there in the garden of Gethsemane, he's on his knees, blood pouring from his face, and he's trying, and his face has been tested. It's been tried. And the fact that you and I were on his mind got him through. And unflinching faith. He progressed his barriers, his challenges. And unflinching faith. Notice this last one. Jesus had selfless service. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to who? Serve and to give his life as a what? A ransom for many. He touched the lepers. He hung out with the politicians. He hung out with the prostitutes. Not worrying about his reputation, but worrying about their salvation. Arthur Maxwell says this, total dedication nerved him to endure the uttermost in suffering while giving the most in selfless service. Giving the most in selfless service. What about us here today? Are we giving in to barriers that we face? Or are we progressing through the barriers? Are we finding our identity and purpose in Jesus? Are we overcoming our barriers with Jesus? In ministry, we have to come across all sorts of people. And I came across this young lady who's got a family, who's going through a lot. The partner is an addict who's in prison at the moment, and she's trying to raise up her child, and the friend that she's living with is an addict also. And so what do you do? How do you overcome that barrier? And the influence around her, she stays in a neighborhood that is influenced by everything. That has people coming up the doors, knocking on doors, trying to buy something that will cope, that will give them that, or they will be able to cope with having more addiction. And this young lady struggles. And I see the struggle that she goes through. And she doesn't know a way out, so what does she do? She gives in as well. And as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, what hope does she have? But what hope does he have? Her son. How can I offer hope? How can I help her in that situation. And I said to this young lady, look, I've been there. And this is the hope. And if God can change my life with my addictions, he can change yours. And so I'm witnessing to this lady and I said, look, don't worry about the environment you live in. God can deal with that. Don't worry about the addictions you have. God can deal with that. Just love him. Surrender to him. Give your life to him. And he'll help you through those addictions. And praise God, this lady now is seeking God. And she wants to have Bible studies. And she asks me to pray with her. 
Sometimes I feel we need these things, these events in our life, these experiences in our life to, to help us understand that there's a world out there that is seeking who? God. That is seeking God. Barriers to progress. Do we have an unflinching faith? A faith that does not crumble at crisis, but rises above the crisis. I was sharing a sermon last week on the signs of the times. And as I was sharing towards the end, I talked about how that period of time, this, this period of persecution will come back and it will test us. How are we going to rise then? How will our faith be then in the martyrs that have gone before us, who have laid down their lives through the dark ages, through the Reformation, and even today, amen? I know of people who are having to worship underground because they have the authorities that don't like who they believe in. We need Christians who have an unflinching faith to stand for Jesus and his righteous ways. John 3, 19 to 21 says this, that there are people who are happy to live in moral darkness. Jesus calls us to be the light, to shine for, his, to, to shine for him, to give them a way out from bondage to freedom. I just think of all the pressures our young people are facing today. We don't understand. Some of us are far removed from understanding the pressures that they're going through. Our world and society is changing. The fact that we can't say the word Jesus in some of our institutions. We can't say that we love God. We need to pray. And by the way, I forgot to share this this morning, but I wanted to do a plug on prayer meeting. And I wanted to put a graph on the screen of the number of people that come to our prayer meetings. What's, I shouldn't say, what's a handful of people? What's the ratio of a handful of people to about 350. Does anyone know? Who's good at maths? What's the percentage? It's low, people. It's low. And these are the number of the people that come to the prayer meeting from this church. I and mean, I'm a strong advocate of prayer meeting, and I believe prayer works. And we've seen that in our group. We've been praying, and some of us can testify to, a, to a, uh, praying about a, uh, for a family. And this family was, was going through problems, and now this family have come together in reconciliation. Amen? Prayer works. But there's a small percentage that come together for prayer on a Wednesday. And I've said before, prayer is the engine room for the church. I can testify to prayer. We stopped for a period of time and I look after another church, but I stopped praying and I could see the attacks of the devil coming in with some of the members. And I said, no, 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 we've got to stop. We've got to get back to prayer meeting. Prayer works. I'd like to encourage us to be involved in prayer. When does it happen, Kylie? Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights. What time? Seven. Where can I find the link? It's in the weekly news. I'll ask you. My prayer is that we can get 10 people on the prayer meeting. That's my prayer. Is that hard? Come on, church. Is that hard? No. And I know we, we pray at home, we pray individually, but collectively as a church, 
Are we praying together? Not just on Sabbaths. Not just other activities, but the prayer meeting that the church promotes. Amen? We need to pray. We need to pray. We need Christians who have an unflinching faith to stand for Jesus. We need Christians to have selfless service. Harriet, Queen Esther, and Jesus all demonstrated selfless love because they were committed and also loving. Are we loving? Are we committed to serving outside our comfort zones? Are we willing to say, not my will, but thy will be done, Lord? Would you like your light to shine through me, Lord? Would you like me to be used to shine my light for others in darkness? I want us to challenge us. My service started off about women with valor, but the service is really for all of us to show courage? Are we willing to push through the barriers? Are we willing to have an unflinching faith? Are we willing to live a selfless life for others? Are we willing to stand up for freedom? Are we willing to stand up for truth? If that is your desire today, join me as I close in prayer. Lord, we're so thankful to be able to hear stories of courage, Lord, from people who you have blessed, who you have worked through. We thank you for the life of Harriet, Lord, and the many people she was able to save and, and rescue. We thank you for the life of Esther, Lord, and how she demonstrated valor, Lord, We pray also that you may be with us. We thank you so much for the greatest example of all, Jesus. And Father, as we've heard these examples, may we be challenged today. May we be stirred in our hearts, Lord, to overcome the barriers, to have an unflinching faith, and to live a life of service. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.